but uh, the plane always flew, and fortunately it always came back. Uh, and it didn't come back in very good shape sometimes, but the next time it was back in shape and off you went again. And we knew who did it. We know that this is the guys that did it. But like I say, it was kind of like, uh, yeah, that's, that's what they do and that's what we do. And I never realized until today that uh, Jer, and I guess the rest of the crew, got there when the 466 got there and stayed there until the 466 mm -hmm. got left there when the war was over. Right. Now, I'm, you, I'm telling you, we, we flew 32 missions in 75 days. These guys were there for a year and a half, you know. Yeah. Uh, and so, and I suppose when we left, they said, well, here comes a new crew, yeah. right? Right. And that's the it's way the it went. Business as usual. Yeah, yeah. But uh, like you said, uh, or I, I said, then it was, that was a very serious situation. And some of these guys would be laughing as they did their thing. Some of them would uh, perhaps need to go off somewhere and be by themselves for a few minutes, but it was a very serious situation. And yeah. uh, we recognized that. And we didn't want to disturb their their thoughts or their actions at that time. And they didn't disturb us because we, we stayed right with it until the last uh, salute to the captain yeah. to go. The leaves would take off the shocks and go. Even when you, all the mission, all the briefing is done, all the preparation is done, you're by the airplane, nothing happens until they shoot a flare. And you shoot a red flare, the whole deal is off. They shoot a green flare, off you go. So even up till the last minute, there's a tension as to whether you may go or you may not go. You never know, because maybe the, the scouting planes found bad weather or they found something, you know, and then they, they call it off. So it was a, up till, and then kind of when you, the green flare, then you kind of say, okay, let's go. Yeah. We were close to uh, Norwich, a, a city by the name of Norwich. And I, I guess uh, it was so crowded in that area. You were close to, you were always close to some base. Mm -hmm. uh, East Angley was just a mass of B-24 bases. And uh, we landed at the wrong base one time. We had to run up, send a guy up to the, to the tower and say, which base is this? You know, no, they all look the same, basically, you know. And the, and the English, uh, when we build a base, we clear out the whole area and put a fence around it and build a base. They just put the base there and leave the people all there. You got farmers and, and cows and sheep grazing on the base. So from the air, it looks just like the, the countryside. You can't identify the base except by the runways. And a lot of the stuff was camouflaged anyway. Uh, so it was very difficult to tell uh, which was your base because there were so many of them. I suspect that then in an extreme emergency, they want to get into any Take basis. any way you can get. Yeah. That's right. Mm -hmm. And you can understand that after so many missions of a regular nature, these crews had to have some rest. And yeah. the stress was just overwhelming to me. And I, I didn't even get involved in it, but I can imagine what they went through never knowing they're going to come back or uh, get blown or whatever the case may be. So they needed uh, some uh, rest and recuperation, R&R. &R. And, and I, I guess they gave you that, didn't you? Yeah, we had t two that I remember. One was just a, just a pass that turned you loose. You go any place you went to. Buzz and I went to London, then to Scotland. Uh, but the other one was like an R&R. &R. They had a, over toward the coast, there's resort type uh, facilities, uh, private facilities, and they had rented one of these, and the man and wife English that owned the place, I guess, or ran it, uh, they made them the caretakers. They send one crew to that house, it was like a private home, and uh, she cooked, great food, and you just goofed off. They had boats to go out and paddle on this little river and so forth. Uh, it was just, I think it lasted maybe three or four days. Total, re total relaxation. Well, yeah. And you needed that, I'm yeah. sure. Oh, yeah. 
Uh, whenever we, I took a, with some of my buddies a, a week in uh, London, we rented an apartment up on about the fourth floor of an older building, and uh, we were able to get sweet milk, milk, yeah. pork and beans, and there was a guy that, uh, an English gentleman, uh, I guess he called him a gentleman, he would come in and shake, shake your shoes and shine them and clean them up. He'd come in your bathroom when you were taking a bath and wash your back and so forth. Yeah. We got a little suspicious of him, but <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he really took care of us. And at that time, it was quite interesting to me, uh, in that old house, old building, to continue the natural gas for cooking or heating, you had to put a shilling in mm. and turn a knob in order for it to continue. Yeah, yeah. Uh, same thing with uh, wa uh, it was gas and water, I believe it was. That's the way they operated. And if you didn't have it, you just didn't get it. <laughs> We had the hunted mission party where they took all the vehicles and put them in a field and put them in MPs around so nobody could drive. The uh, mess hall was open 24 hours. The theater was open uh, 24 hours, and I worked in the theater. But also, uh, Glenn Miller and his band played, and which was great, and they brought the girls in from the little villages around, and we had fun dancing with those pretty little things. And uh, I went up to him and I had two pound, uh, or three pounds, I think they were about three bucks a piece. And then the uh, seal, or the water seal, I asked him to sign his signature, which he did on two of them. And of course he was so, he was kind of, had been drinking some adult beverages. <laughs> but nice guy. It was very accommodating, and I took those uh, things. I eventually took them back to Hapeville, Georgia, and gave gave them to the, one of the prettiest little old girls you've ever seen in your life. <laughs> and uh, we had a, a we stole the barrel of uh, beer and put it into our barracks, so we wouldn't have to go far to get some. <laughs> and that was quite a, a party we had. One. A bit of humor, uh, on July the 4th, 1944, I believe it was, Independence Day, one of the guys accidentally, on purpose, shot a flare to celebrate July the 4th. Well, you don't do that, at the, you know, and when you're in war, <laughs> and the next thing you know, somebody else over here shot one, yeah. and before you know it, every plane, <laughs> uh, one of the ground crews would shoot a flare, red flare, <laughs> celebrate July the 4th. Of course, we all got eat out about that, <laughs> but uh, we were determined to celebrate in some manner. We, I had a 45. Uh, you were issued a 45. Yeah. We were, we were not, but I got a hold of one. And uh, the guys, you know, they like to have one of those 45, and I got 45, my crew chief, uh, Bennett Smith, he would look after us, get us a summer flying suit, keep us warm, and and uh, he got us a 45, and we kept them hid. And whenever we were ready to go home, the lieutenant said, now we're going to come to your barracks and examine your duffel bags, and if anybody has a 45 in there, they're taken back to the States we're going to ground them and put them back here for another six months. <laughs> so we went out, you see these guys going out, and they buried those 45s. Sort of right? <laughs> one of my best one was uh, uh, a little uh, a Mexican boy from Del Hart, Texas. His name was Frank Crespin. And not many people would have too much to do with him, but I, I liked the guy. He and I hit it off very well and became friends. And uh, he was uh, married and had one child, I believe. Of course, I was single and he would never go out with me whenever I was dating anybody. But uh, he was true to his wife. But on base, we, were, we became real good friends and occasionally we'd go out together. 
and have beer and that sort of thing. And we'd, he'd get in the fights and I'd have to, uh, I wouldn't help him. I'd let him fight his own battles. But yes, and then we had a, I had a buddy by the name of uh, Leon Franklin from uh, Alabama. And he, what he did was service the oxygen tanks before mm. you went on a fight. I'd be sure that they were full. Other than that, uh, now, Bennett Smith and myself and Carmen, we got along great and worked as a good team, but we weren't really what you call real close uh, buddies at, at, when we were off duty. And, uh, but those are the basically the ones that I had. Another thing is we made friends with the English countryside people. They were so nice and helpful and whenever we left we asked that uh, can we give our extra blankets and uh, to the English people who didn't have very much and they said no you'll have to burn them we had to pile them up and burn them and, the, and when we left the English countryside people came forth and when we took off or when we left in the train you could see them crying we had built up that type of oh, a yeah. friendship with them. Well, one of my furloughs in London, uh, I had uh, uh, was dating a young nurse, and uh, it's a complete blackout. And uh, we had purchased, I had purchased a, a fifth uh, a black and white scotch, and she and I were in Hyde Park at midnight a lot of time drinking that uh, scotch and about that time a buzz bomb came over and it scared me and I asked her I said what are, you, what are we supposed to do she said you don't do a thing until it stops and when it stops it goes down and explodes <laughs> and uh, but we listened in very intently and it stopped and we held our breath and several miles over, it exploded and so we get back to our drinking, our scotch. <laughs> it, it did buzz, that's why they call it a buzz bomb. It buzzed and then when it stopped, that's when it quit. <laughs> that's when the engine gave out. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And also the uh, V2, it was a little faster, higher. Yeah. Uh, I've been one occasion when I was there on a um, furlough, one of those came over and blasted and knocked us out of bed, but hey, that's all, that's not any big deal. Uh, on a, one occasion, when Patton ran out of fuel for his tanks in uh, France, we had to put in Bombay fuel tanks and in order to carry this uh, 80 octane to him for his tanks and he wanted other things you know like in our particular case we carried a, a sink yeah. and uh, we would we would take it that was the only time the two times that I had an opportunity to ride in the waste is this time and one time when the war was over they took us on a mm -hmm. uh, show us what damage had been done yeah and that, and, and, and that case uh, when we were flying over looking at the damage uh, on the way back over the city of Berlin, I believe it was Berlin, I was laying down in the, by the waist and bullets came up close to my feet. <laughs> Somebody on the ground was, fly, was, sh was shooting at us. Didn't surrender yet. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't have any close calls at all as far as that is concerned. Well, I'll tell you one thing that uh, did happen that almost killed me, and I don't know why I didn't, but we were in our barracks one day, and I was writing a letter on my back turn facing the wall, and there was a GI over here cleaning his 45, and it accidentally fired. And I had a cardboard box with my envelope and so forth, and it came through that cardboard box, and hit right in front of me in the center block and blinded me like that and scared me. And they all thought that I had 
been shot and was dead. <laughs> and uh, and that, that was a close call, but as far as uh, any close calls like these guys have, it never happened. Well, did you, uh, what, was, it, was there any more danger in hauling gasoline than bombs? Uh, no, I don't think so. Uh, I don't know, Bill. What do the you think? Gas was all enclosed, uh, and we weren't flying over hostile territory, yeah. so uh, I guess uh, fire could have caused a big explosion, but basically the, the gas was in cans or in these big wing tanks and so forth, and uh, I don't think anything ever happened like with the, the gas runs. No, it was a very successful yeah. mission. Uh, <clears throat> and it didn't take very long to get over there. That was a very, sh very short flight, yeah. Mm -hmm. And also at the time, uh, I don't know if you got involved in it, Bill, but we, w some of those crews were making two missions a day, uh, blasting the uh, <coughs> buzz bomb installations over mm -hmm. in France. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah. I don't know if you did any of that sort of yeah. thing. Yeah, yeah. You know, that really isn't. There really wasn't a celebration, you know, like in certain terms of making it a big event of it. Everybody was just kind of yeah. done, you know, it's, it's over. Uh, and in fact, I thought about it many times with these guys. I don't even recall saying goodbye to these people, you know what I mean? Yeah. Of course, we didn't, we didn't live it together, but uh, maybe we did come over. I don't know, but I thought of myself, you know, all this time, we've gone through all this, and now all we can think about is getting the hell out of here, you know, and um, you hardly go back and uh, say goodbye to anybody. Uh, and I don't remember any, we probably went down the officers club and had a, a good shot of booze, no question about that. <laughs> but otherwise, uh, I don't think we did anything. And you just hung around for orders to, to go home. I don't know who painted the uh, beautiful lady on it. I uh, don't know where the, uh, the name came from. He painted the bombs on it. Yeah, I still have the stencil that I use as hanging in my computer room at home. With, uh, as a, I started to bring it, but uh, anyway, that that's the only thing that I really have in there. I had a buddy that over at Delta was in charge of the photo photography, and he made me a a large uh, enlargement of Dirty Gertie, and I've got it to hang in there without uh, Brazier. <laughs> <laughs> I know that uh, when Jack sent me all of his pictures, his wife, I think, and Mark threw all the uh, <laughs> pictures <laughs> at the appropriate place. So she didn't appreciate that. But, well, you know, that's the way things were back at that time. Uh, we were just a wild bunch trying to they were still alive yeah. and the, we all had wives and girlfriends and that's what made the world go around yeah <laughs> yeah most of the artwork involved females <laughs> in some and that's great that's good and healthy there's nothing wrong with yeah. that but, uh, but you said jack didn't jack's wife didn't appreciate it no she uh, apparently it told him to, on the pictures he sent me that showed her. They were blacked out uh, <laughs> over the appropriate place. She was a good Catholic girl, Jack's wife. <laughs> uh, and uh, we miss him. Yes, sir. I'm sorry that I didn't get involved earlier with the whole uh, 10 crew members. And uh, you, you don't know how, how it impressed me when I got a telephone call when I was living in Peachtree City, and uh, it was from uh, Nick. Yeah. Said, is this Jerry Williams yeah. at the World War II? And I said, yeah. And, said, and he told the story, you know. And I said, well, how nice of somebody that is interested in getting in touch with me. And uh, I'm sorry that I didn't get a chance to yeah. know you guys. Uh, and Nick was but, good that way. And, and he got your name. Because you responded to, what is this airplane? Yes, uh -huh. yeah. that's right. Yeah. And uh, also, I think uh, he wrote a, a note that was published also in that particular issue. Yeah. Of the, uh, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, the night, the time that I attended uh, 
in 2000 in Salt Lake City. I flew in that uh, morning and uh, stayed with you guys. Yeah. And then I flew out on the last flight back to Delta. I didn't even stay in the hotel. Is that right? I had reservations. Yeah. But I didn't stay there. I, I had to pay my 85 bucks anyway. <laughs> but I just wanted to go ahead and get home once I, re I was. I was operating on a pass. <laughs> <laughs>